I'm very happy to introduce uh, uh, Professor Hans-Peter Haferkamp uh, from University of uh, Cologne and uh, Institute of Modern History of Private Law, German and Rhenish Legal History. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he will talk today about uh, the general clauses or general clauses. Uh, he made some years ago uh, already a full course on uh, general clauses uh, uh, at the University of Tartu and is one of the best specialists to this. Uh, and now we will uh, hear the shorter version, which talks about private law, but actually the question of general clauses and uh, uh, the uses, application and dangers are relevant also in public law, even more than in private law and in international law. So I hope that uh, everybody will have its own uses and possibilities to uh, to think about it in the context uh, of their own work. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Faisy, for this kind um, introduction. Um, you see, I changed the top, the, the title uh, to make it a big, bit more political, perhaps, to make clear. I do not want to talk about um, some rather technical issues. I will talk about politics in a way. Um, so what is this lecture? about what's a general clause it's it's a term clausula generalis is already in roman law um, it comes up in germany this term um, around 1900 and we will perhaps talk about this time a bit bit uh, more in detail i uh, make a very broad definition general clause is something we do not know what it wants to tell us it's a very unprecise norm on the one hand, and this is the interesting thing, it's, it's a norm, it's a statute. And on the other hand, there's nothing in it. It's a whole within the law. And um, this is the interesting point in these general clauses. But if you have this definition, you can see um, it's, uh, um, it's uh, um, not a strict separation between a concrete norm and a general clause. Every norm can be a bit more in concrete and a bit more going to general clauses. So um, I will have two more concrete introductions. The first is the introduction, why has Germany in special, uh, a special history with, with general clauses? Why is there a typical German approach to this topic? And the second is what do I mean concretely with um, general clauses? Which general clauses have been discussed at least in Germany? So the first is there is a um, um, concept by Christoph Schönberger, a colleague of mine in Cologne, uh, um, constitutional lawyer, and he wrote a book about the German approach. He said there's something very German which uh, uh, differentiates uh, our kind of legal thinking from most other countries in the world. And uh, I think there is something true in it. So uh, I will try to explain to you this German approach uh, which makes the general clause topic interesting for German. If you, it's all a question, uh, who has who has the power? You can say in a in a legal system, the power is by the judge, or the power is by the people, the government, the legislation. If you look to Germany, you could say, um, the concept of the free judge, the old wise man deciding the case. Um, has been all over in Germany, uh, um, has been there, especially in cities uh, till the 18th, 19th century. There were still parts in German law where um, there were men deciding the case which were not educated in law and which did not obey the law. They produced law. In 19th century, it was only very small eras around uh, patrimonial judges around uh, um, very little villages. So the free judge um, 
is a concept which was still there, but which was decreasing and dying in the 19th century. Uh, Germany had never had a trust in the free judge, I would say, since the Middle Ages. Another concept comes up, this Roman law concept. There is a judge which is bound to the law. He's obeying the law. He's working with the law. And so it was, it was obvious for centuries already, but in the 19th century, it was decided that the free judge is not a concept in Germany. So the question is, if German had a bound judge, what is he, how do we bind this judge? Which is he binded to? Two concepts you can have. You can say the judge is bound to judges. So this is the precedent concept, the, the Anglo-American concept. Um, so judge made law is the deci deciding thing. How was it with this in Germany? We had this concept of the usus fori. So the long living judiciary decisions, the long living judge made law was seen as binding as a statute. So it was part of the sources of the law. The problem in Germany was that um, the decisions have not been published systematically, that the decisions of the judiciary have not been published systematically until 1847. So before that, everyone is talking about an usus fori, but no one can prove it because you don't have the decisions. And this was a, it's a long story why it is like this in Germany, but this was the problem. So, then there started a discussion, do we want this? But in a way it was too late. When we got all these decisions, Savigny was the one who wanted that and he uh, um, reached his aim <clears throat> to publish most of the important decisions. Um, but in a way, <clears throat> another concept had already won the, the running between these two alternatives. And this was the concept system. <clears throat> you must see Germany, in these days by legal scholars is seen as a nation without a state. So there is a German nation, but there is no German state. <clears throat> so that, so the, the, the reason is if you are, the, the result is if you want to produce national law, there is no legislation for it. So there starts a concept, especially by Savigny, and he says, Let's use the, uni the universities. And the universities make a an, make an very similar education concept. And this in the middle of this education concept, we take um, contemporary Roman law, the Roman law which is still in use in Germany. And this contemporary Roman law we take in the middle and we make a special education in methodologies and then we pr produce very similar jurists. And these jurists produced by university, they go to court and then they, they have all these very different territorial laws. But if they, if, if they have the same juridical mind, they, the same methodological setting in their work, then this will produce the same law. This is how they do it and this is how, they, how it works. The German unification uh, in private law especially is produced by judges. Uh, and only in, in the secondary way, 1900, by the civil code. Before that, we already, already had several courts, which were so important that all over, your, all over Germany, every other court tried to organize itself as this leading court did. And <clears throat> the key system in, in methods was system. How does, does this develop and what is the typical German way? You could say it's a very simple uh, and very, um, very simple idea. You could say it's a way from case to concept to system. What do I mean with that? <clears throat> you could say this is a very um, dangerous view, but you could say Case law is the thing that starts in Rome and in the Middle Ages. 
the digests have lots and lots of cases, and these cases were debated. In these cases, there is some systematic thinking hidden. But anyway, the beginning starts with cases. In the Middle Ages, sorry, this is here. In the Middle Ages, <clears throat> the scholars at the Italian universities, they have a, a very specific way of working with these Roman sources. We do not have to discuss this closer, but the result is that they pr produce concepts, the concept of property, the concept of um, contract. They produce <clears throat> abstract concepts. So this is an European project. It's all over Europe the same. Wherever you have Roman law, you have these kind of working with these old antique cases. This is also a European project. Wherever you have these Italian-based universities working with this Roman law, they produce concepts and they are discussed all over Europe. But then there comes something German. Between 1880, uh, 1780 and 1810, the German jurisprudence changes from jurisprudentia to jurisciencia. The German lawyers become a Rechtswissenschaft. And this is the overtaking of a Kantian concept. Kant says it's not all about knowledge, it's about producing knowledge which is organized in the way of our legal thinking, in the way of the Vernunft. This organizing our knowledge in the way of our legal thinking, in the way of the thinking of the Vernunft, the human conscious, is called system. What they do in Germany now is they quit the old concept, which has something to do with justice and something to do with the ability to, to uh, uh, um, decide cases. They quit this old concept and say, we have a new, we have a new concept. Our concept, what we will have to do at the universities, we as the professors, we have to produce systems. And we do not produce ideal systems. So we are not interested in natural law, this old Hugo Grossio, Samuel Pufendorf, Thomas Hobbes, Christian Wolf, all these legal thinkers. This is not our aim. We produce systems of positive law. We take the existing law and we try to understand it and to understand it to begreifen, to conceptualize, conceptualize the existing law, we have to build systems. This is what they do. It's not only the way of Savigny who does it, it's also the way of Gustav Hugo, Thibault and others. Some do it with Kant, some do it with Hegel, some do it with Schelling, whatever. They all build systems. And this concept, and this is important to me, this concept is not only a scientific concept, legal dogmatics, coherent systematic thinking, logical reasoning. It's also a political concept. The political concept means if we think in private law, then the aim of private law is to, to achieve a separation between society and the state. And if you want to separate society and private law is the, is the ability from the, of the, for the society to organize itself by contracts and property and all these, these things. Um, we have to discuss how can we secure society against the state? And there were two concepts in 19th century Germany. The first concept was constitution. We need a constitution and the monarch uh, gives us this constitution and this will secure society against the state. This constitutional concept got several crises in 19th century. One enormous crisis was 1837 in Göttingen, uh, the break of the constitution by the monarch. So there was another system, another, another concept. And this, this concept, this is important. This concept means system. Rudolf von Jering said, system is the twin sister of freedom. What does this mean? If we as jurists produce a coherent, systematic, logical, conceptual, so conceptualized private law, everyone who wants to, to 
decide something in this system is forced to speak this language. He's forced to use our concepts. So if he wants to do something new, he is allowed to work with an analogy or with a fiction. So he can use what we have and he say, okay, I, I put something on the system aside, but we take the concepts of the system to understand this. We stay within the system. And if I want to do this, something which the system does not allow, I have to break the system. And this is what they want. Yering says, if a politician tries to interfere in our private law, he can only break the system. He cannot bend it. So legal dogmatics, logical think thinking, this typical German systematic way of thinking private law is a security against the state. This is the idea they have. And this is 1858. So in this idea, general clauses are a hole in the system. They are a problem. This hole is simply, there is a way to get into the system from outside without the control of the concept. And then all the things, Changes, 1880, 1871, the state takes over. The science goes back, loses its power. The professors lose their power. The judiciary loses its power. The state takes over. And what now happens is, this is the state makes such a dogmatic, very lively and developing system, a scientific system, which always is going on and develops and is discussed such a lively organism, they called it, is made into a codification. So in, in the way it's stopped, it's fixed. And this fixed system, this is the Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch, which comes up in 1900. And this Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch is in a way a mirror of the old uh, um, science, of the old systematic thinking of the Pandectists, they take over many ideas from them, and some political changes, but many old ideas. So it's very national, natural that part of the codification are these general clauses. Because these general clauses, I will show you now, they are part of the Roman law. The Romans had these general clauses. It was never discussed to throw them out. So it's very natural that they are part of the code. But now something has changed. Before that, they were part of the system. So you had to systematize these general clauses. They had some, some techniques to work with these general clauses. Now they are part of a very strict binding codification. And now the 20th century starts. And the 20th century is the century where many, many lawyers, judges, and professors think these general clauses are not so much a problem, they are a chance because now we have a codification which is strictly binding, much more binding than we, e than we ever had in Germany. We never had such a binding by law. And these very concrete, conceptualized, coherent BGB system makes the German scholars to, makes them look at these general clauses. They become more and more important. So what do, you mean, do I mean with these general clauses? Good faith is one which is the most important one in Germany. Good customs or good morals, hard to translate. Boni mores, the Romans said, is a very old concept, totally different to good faith, totally different history, quite close to public order, state-oriented concept, while good faith is a more contractual partners-oriented concept. But we will not uh, differentiate too much uh, with this concept concretely. Public order, which was uh, um, not over, which was uh, um, not accepted in Germany as a, uh, a general clause in the code, but for, in France, for example, it's a it's part of the code civil. And the today most important, perhaps in Germany, uh, not in other countries, I think, is the abuse of rights. Very important concept, which is very closely influenced still today from national socialist, socialist thinking, very problematic concept, but it is very powerful for the judges, still in use. Chicanery is the older concept. We can talk about this, it takes too, too much time. What do you want to do with you now? 
now I show you some concepts. So some, some key concepts, what are general clauses all about? What is their, their topic? What is their, their aim? What is their problem? And there were some in the 20th century, I tell you, I show you some. Terms of valve, empty concepts, royal paragraphs, a, a, flaming, a flaming sword, an open texture piece of legislation, norms of delegation, cuckoo eggs, gateways, gateway for arbitrary decisions, cultural norms. What I want to do now is I simply take some of them, I do not take all these concepts, and go to the, through the 20th century and show you what these, these little concepts and terms were about, what was the, the hidden story behind these little terms. So let's start. The first is general clauses as royal paragraphs, very famous in Germany. There is one uh, legal scholar in Germany who, who is, he is Mr. General Clauses. He worked on this topic for all his life and he changed his opinion every 15 years, I would say. Uh, so in the beginning, he was rather liberal. Uh, he became rather, rather conservative in Weimar Republic and he became a, a, a very intensive national socialist thinker after that. And then he came back to the, to the Bundesrepublik and he was fond of the Bundesrepublik. So he changed all this, his political opinion from time to time. So every legal practitioner, this is the famous text, knows that the fate, fate of these individual paragraphs of our codification of civil law has become, have become quite different. There are kings among them, but there are also beggars, important and non-important statutes, statutes in the new code. This is 1913. The code is, in, is already 13 years applied. And this is what is, what is the 100 paragraphs from one corner from the law of succession. They are all very unimportant, not used by the judiciary. So, but there is one royal rule, good faith. So he's the first one who say, not the first, but one of the first important ones who say, these are very important norms, these general clauses. And we love them, they are kings, they are not beggars. What's the background of this story? Around 1900, Germany changes abruptly. Germany becomes the country of legal methodology. In legal method methodology in Germany means um, if we teach students legal methods, we teach them what a judge is allowed to do when he decides a case. So we talk about the difference between applying and breaking the law. Methods can be something totally different. Method could be how to build a system, how to build a concept. We do not discuss this in Germany. In the 19th century, this was rather discussed. What is a system? What does a scientist do when he builds a system? This is not discussed in 20th century anymore. In 20th century, we only discuss the judge. And around 1900, there was a great fear that this codification is much too strictly binding, much too close. There is a background story because most German scholars did not like the codification because they said, it's wrongly organized and it's, it's wrongly political, wrong political concept. It's unsocial, they said. It's too liberal. So prison cells, one of them cells, there are other quite funny uh, um, sentences about the BGB. They did not like it. So what did, did, they, did they start? They started a discussion, what is the judge allowed to do? And this discussion was always emancipated so it was always, always against the law. Nobody ever produced a theory which has the aim to bind the judge strictly to the will of the legislator. The aim was always to give the judge as much freedom as we can allow him. What we do not allow him is to frankly break the law. So we try to get close to this frontier and say, this is allowed, you can also do this, and this is also still allowed, and so like this. We had some methodological schools, um, which I cannot discuss with you now, but they are part of this time. 
the free law movement. You may have heard about this, Herman Kantarovich and other scholars. The jurisprudence of interests, Philip Heck and other scholars. This is all tying part of this huge debate. And there's also something special. Germans find out that there is, that reality shapes the law. Reality means the industry makes their, their own laws by building contracts. The freedom of contracts, the contract produces law. And the contractual partners, they have their contracts. And if these contracts get very similar, um, what is it? Allgemeine Geschäftsbedingung is easy. Allgemeine Geschäftsbedingung, who knows it? Terms so, of terms of contract or legal term? Yes, general terms of contract. General terms or something like this. However, the, they get more and more the impression that uh, reality produces law and this reality has to be obeyed by the judge. So they they try to, to get this judge to be more in society, more in social uh, um, developments, more in, in uh, industrial and economically problems. So um, they try, they, they open their mind to other sources of the law and they tell the judge, you have to know this, you have to get more more practice you have to got in contact to the to the big companies you have to know what they do something like this so this is the part between 1914 when most german scholars say there's some hope in these general clauses they could uh, give us the um flexibility to reorganize private law through the judges through the freedom of the judges to produce new law and the judges do this very intensively between 1914. Industry, business law, okay. Now we, we skip to another, this is uh, a very, the, perhaps the most famous, the escape to general clause, die Flucht in die Generalklausel, it's very hard to translate. Uh, um, recourse to general clauses, I think escape into general clauses uh, is not English, but perhaps it's, uh, it's good to understand man gave short because before the national tune is important to know because the book came up in 1933 and many always think it's a national social socialist book which is not true he says there are three risks no general clauses become a danger he says and this is the, the first risk is typical german i would say the heavy work of constructing if there is a new idea coming up in law it has to be constructed Construction means it has to be put into legal concepts we have. We have to make it part of the system. Still this dogmatic thinking. And they say if, these ju if the judges use these general clauses, they simply stop thinking in systematic way. They just decide the case. The second risk. So what will be the, the result then? He says, feelings is that instead of concepts de-rationalization of the law, he says. The judges do what they want. And very interesting is the third risk. This has become quite famous. He says there is also a political danger. Because nobody knows what good faith or good morals is because it's an empty space, a black box. He says this could be used in a political way. If nobody knows what it is, and your politics is divided into two classes, estates, religions, ideologies, or groups. It could be so that one group says, I tell you what good morals are. So it could be a technique to rule a body of, the, of a people by a, an elite using these very broad concepts. And th there's a funny story behind, um, he says, Byzantium arises, he argues with Roman history. And he says, the late Romans, the late Roman emperors, they did this. The late Byzantine, Byzantine Roman emperors, they destroy, destroyed the old coherent systematic Roman law and 
took instead of that the equitas. They always wanted to decide it like the equitas. This is, Hesi, you will know this better, perhaps not very true, but it's a story of Fritz Pringsheim. He wrote, a, he wrote some texts about this in 1920. And this is a, a theory which is very closely linked to the Weimar developments. They always say, uh, we are, this is a, um, uh, the world is going, is, is dying, the, the Germany is dying as a country because of the Weimar Republic. This is like the old Rome. So what is, what is behind that? First thing, it's not a national socialist view. You will see. His third fear is almost exactly what the nationalists will do one year later. Um, that was a surprise to him, and it was a problem to him because um, he had to change his mind quite, quite abruptly, quite fast, because the National Socialists offended him very strongly in the beginning, and he wanted to become a leading National Socialist, so uh, he had to change his opinion very fast, and he did. This was no problem for Justus Wilhelm Hedemann. So, um, no, he looked to Russia. He had Russia in mind, Lenin. And he say, the socialist concepts, they work with this very broad uh, um, socialist justice uh, concepts. And they use them politically to steer the judiciary over political concepts coming from, from, top, from top down. And um, with the result that the judge does not do what's in the law, he does what the politicians want. This is what he fears. Um, what's the background of that? The background is that there was a huge crisis in Weimar Republic, and the most important crisis was, was the so-called Aufwertungsrechtsprechung. There was an inflation problem. The state wanted the inflation because the state used the inflation to uh, pay back his debts to, his, uh, um, uh, to the creditors, for example, to France, but also to, the, to, the, to his own people. The people had lent money to the state and he gave it back to, to them by using an inflation. So if you, if you give him 100,000 Reichsmark and he gives you 100,000 Reichsmark back and there is an inflation behind, he gives you one Reichsmark back de facto. The Euro, he pays his debt. So this is what the state did. And there was a huge debate in society. So the state said, we have to do it to, to uh, pay the French but he also used it to pay his own debts to the, to the people. So, and the judges corrected that. They tried, there was a, a struggle between the judiciary and the state because the judiciary, they, they themselves, the judges we know, uh, um, wanted money from the state because they had lent some money to him. So there was a struggle and the, um, the judges used Troy and Glauben, good faith, to correct, at least they, they tried to do this, they, it did not really happen, but they, um, they offended the state and say, if you, if you use this concept, we will correct the Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch with good faith. And we will say, okay, if, I, if you owe me 100,000 and we have an inflation, we correct this and now you owe me 10 million. Because this, this is the time worth of the money of 100,000 rice mark. So they tried to correct it. And they used general clauses. So general clauses was in everyone's mind in these days. General clauses came up as a political instrument. At least it was the beginning of this story. This is something to do with the political situation in, in Weimar. I told you, and there is a story behind. Um, the judges were conservative in Weimar. So they were quite still monarchists, most of them. They were close to the old order. The German Republic me meant that the most important party in the legislation in the parliament was the Social Democrats party. Almost no judge was part of the Social Democrats party. So they had huge distance to the legislation. The judges and also many professors tried to, to 
do something against legislation because it was not their legislation. What did they do? They used their power. The judges used judiciary. They used general clauses. The professors, for example, used arguing with, nat with natural law. They said there is a super positive law and this law is more important than what the legis legislator does. We have to correct. So this, there was a huge debate between the state and the judges and the professors about the position of the judge. And many of them were quite open to a judge correcting the law. Justice William Hedeman in these days was very skeptic. He said, this is a bad way we go. We will have a Richterkönig, also a royal judge, which is not a good German concept. Their view, we can discuss this, was in a philosophical way. They were anti-positivists. They did not like anybody, anybody who wants to obey the law. And they were anti-liberal, which meant especially they were anti-democrats. They did not want the legislation to decide. They wanted to decide themselves. They were the masters of the values, not the constitution not the legislation. One year later, one of these young, aggressive national socialist thinkers, a young professor in Breslau, Heinrich Lang. He's one of these national socialists, which I really like because he explains to you how they think. He's very clear in how, how national socialist thinking works. And he sees exactly the chance of the general clauses. And he sees exactly what is the enemy to them. The enemy to them is systematic thinking. System as twin sister, as twin sister of freedom. This liberal concept by hearing. Concrete, exact, coherent norms. This is binding. This meant to the National Socialist, it's binding to old Republican law, which they could not accept. And as the National Socialists had huge problems to produce a new codification, this never worked. They tried it till 1942 and then stopped the project. Um, they argued very intensively, what can we do? And the one who had this first answer is Heinrich Lang. Therefore, individualism requests the stipulation of clear boundaries for the freedom of action. So this is the The liberal concept. This is what the German code tried to do. This is what the scholars in the 19th century tried to do. Boundaries. In another text, Heinrich Lange says, national socialism destroys the form of law. All kind of formal thinking is positivistic, is liberalistic, is bad. So for these liberalists, why do they use these boundaries? They want legal certainty. They do not want the prophecies of the judge will do in fact, they will the foreseeability of what the judge will do in fact. They want to know, well, he, this is how he will have to decide. This is a typical liberal thinking. And what do they want? They do not want external predictability. They want a flexible and unpredictable justice. They want good faith and good customs because they want a judge who decides, as he says, Heinrich Lange says, in the people's will. He decides just the man on the street will, have, will hear this decision and he says, that's a just decision. Listen to the body of the people, he says. Karl Schmidt will tell us this is not the right story. But, um, and he says the famous words of Kukuex, you, will, you live in a country which still has countryside. So you will have cuckoos and you know that cuckoos are special birds. They are in the foreigners 
in, uh, in the family of another bird and they throw out the other birds. They're very strong birds. And these cuckoos in a liberalistic system, so the liberalists destroyed themselves by putting these um, general clauses into their codification. That was their mistake. This was the cuckoo they set in their own uh, um, family place. What's the history behind this? General Heinrich Lange starts a huge story which is still present in Germany today. And the story is, is called, general clauses are gateways. They are doors, doors which allow other law to get into the old law. And the interesting story behind this is, why should it be necessary for a national socialist judge to use general clauses? Why did they do this? Why don't they say, this is a norm from the Weimar Republic. The Weimar Republic is not our state. We are national socialists. So this norm is not in use anymore. I'm not obeyed to old law. The National Socialists, they would have liked this. They would have said, this is just uh, statute law and statutes are typical uh, legal and typical old style legal thinking. You, the judge has to decide as the life decides, something like this. So the judges got offered this, this alternative, but they did not choose it. They did not want it. They still tried to, to um, make a legal reasoning you could call its polite unpolitical. They still wanted to say to the parties, which just the, the Jewish party, for example, which just lost the case, and you read this case and you say, this is absolutely illegal what the judges did. And they'd say, they would say, no, 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 this was not illegal. This was a result from good faith. Because good faith has to be interpreted in a national socialist way. And good faith is part of the, of the code. So I just applied the code. I did not do anything wrong. This is a story very intensively debated in uh, um, uh, legal history for 40, 50 years now. We can discuss this, but that's, that's how it was. They use general clauses, you could say, still to stay judge and not to become an open political uh, decider. Behind this, there is a story. Which I just, no, 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 let's not start another story. Uh, um, we will talk about it in, in 10 minutes. Um, how tied was this judge? What's, how to, what, what did this mean for the judges, the new setting? Let me just uh, go over to Carl Schmidt. You may know Carl Schmidt. He was um, already a very famous uh, um, authoritarian thinker, um, constitutional lawyer, very famous as a, a, a lawyer, defending um, the National Socialist already. Um, and he was the one who very much influenced these young National Socialist scholars. There was a university in Kiel where many of them were also in Berlin. And uh, these young scholars, they took him as in the beginnings, only between 1933 and 1936, I would say. And then his star was falling. Uh, was decreasing, um, but in the beginning he was he was the the star of the National Socialist professors in Germany, and he made this concept by Heinrich Lange much more precise. He said he 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 pointed out the political story, which is strictly which is quite closely connected to this general class concept of the National Socialist. First, he says, a person who considers himself above 
and depending on the facts of the case against national law enters the terrain of politics. Somebody who decides against the case is in a political sphere. This is typical Karl Schmidt. Begriff des Politischen. So um, law is, as other things, a field of political fights. And to judge, by liberating himself from the binding nature of natural law, the judge does not enter a sphere of pure right, but only an area of political fights. That means to the judge. If you judge say, I just decided only because um, good faith forces me to do that, Karl Schmidt would say, no, 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 this was a political decision. And if you say, what is good faith? It's my duty as a judge to um, argue with good faith and I'm the one who has to find out what's good faith. Karl Schmidt sa says, no, 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 this is wrong. General clauses are not a field of free juridical decisions. It's not a field of power of the judiciary. It's a political sphere. The restraint of the judge is unaffected by general clauses. He is still bound, but to what? Before that, everyone would have said what good faith is, what good customs is, is a black box. It's judge-made law. They have to find out there is nothing in it. It's empty. Nobody knows what good faith is. There's nothing in it. Even in the 19th century, Roman lawyers like Pernice said exactly that. They said, we shouldn't know too much. So there's just freedom. And now Karl Schmidt says, no, 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 no. There is no freedom. There is something in it. And one, it's what's in it. Finally, in all commentaries, textbooks, and judgments, general clauses always refer to the prevailing views and concepts of values. There are values in these general clauses. What values and where do they come from? The prevailing views and concepts of a people, of the people in its whole, are always characterized by the views and, co and concepts of a certain leading and decisive group or movement. This is exactly Justus Wilhelm Hedemann, 1932. This is what he said. If nobody knows what's in, and one group says, we will tell you what's in, then the politics took over. And this is exactly what Karl Schmidt does. However, it's, it is not views or concepts in general that are prevailing, leading and decisive, but the views of a particular influential persons. In the present German state, the National Socialist Movement is leading. Does any division of good customs, good faith must be based on its principles? This is the politicization of the general clauses in Germany. Before that, general clauses were empty spaces and judge-made law. Even in Weimar, there was no clear political concept, except perhaps these Aufwertungsrechtsprechungen, where the judges had a political aim. In general, there was no political concept within these general clauses. They were just empty. It was an allowance for judge-made law, nothing else. Now, this changes. What does this mean? The one interesting question is, or the one development which is interesting for the next times to come is for the first time in Germany, there is a kind of norm pyramid, you know, Hans Kelsen's concept. There is the, there is the, uh, um, the uh, um, constitution, there is the normal national law and there is the under national law like a pyramid. This idea which Kelsen produced in, in Vienna has not been important in Germany. That means especially the German judges did not say that constitution 
produces law which allows them to correct the normal state law. And now for the first time, yeah. The National Socialists say, no, there is a higher law. And this higher law has to be put into the normal state law, into the Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch. And they use the gateways, the Generalklauseln, to push this National Socialist law into the existing positive law. So Karl Schmidt says, we do not have to alter anything. It's already there. The national socialist law is already part of positive law because we have the general clauses and they are political. So everything's there. We don't have to change anything. And if the judge decides wrong, we say, sorry, you did not obey the law. And if he said, if he would say, uh, it was a general clause, what do I know what's in it? They would say, no, no, no. In the general clauses, there is the political opinion of the National Socialist Party. And if you argue against it, you did not obey the law. So from now on, the general clauses have an content. It's not an empty space anymore. And this story goes on till today. Because after 1949, when the German Democratic Republic um, came up, um, you will see there was quite a discussion between the high court judges in Germany and the Bundesverfassungsgericht, the high constitutional court, decided that this concept will be in use again. It's Günther Dürig, a professor in Tübingen. He was not so much a national socialist, but he uses the same word, Einbruchstellen, gateways, the same word Heinrich Lange had used in 1933. And he said, he said general clauses are gateways, but now there's another higher supra positive law. It's the constitution. From now on, the High Constitutional Court in Germany says the Constitution is a value system. And this value system, behind the wordings of the Constitution, there's a system. And this system of values, this has to be put into private law by using the general clauses. The same concept in the way. But on the first, it was very bad because it was National Socialist law. Now it's very good because it's constitutional law. But the concept is exactly the same. But if you think a bit closer about this, what Carl Schmidt says is for the judge a huge problem. Because on the one hand, you could say, no, okay, he knows what to do. He has to decide in a national socialist way. But that is not so easy because there is no fixed national socialist legal theory. You may know Hitler hated law. And if would there, there somebody would have come up and said, okay, this is the national socialist law, he would never have obeyed it. We have cases where he even saved Jews because he, he liked them as military men. There's the sentence, who is Jew? I decide who is Jew. So not even this anti-Semitic core concept of the National Socialists was absolutely secure. Even there, Hitler said, there can be exceptions. So, and if you go, go to private law, which I'm interested here, it's even more complex. Then one of the um, concepts, for example, was trust. Trust is a very National Socialist concept. But what does this mean? I give you one example that, that was uh, discussed after 49. It, it was, would never have been discussed in the National Socialist time. Eva Braun, you will know, she was the girlfriend and the wife of Hitler in this, when he died. And one, one said, what would we have done if 
everyone in Germany has to um, give his fur coat to the military man because they are dying in, in, uh, um, in Russia. So if you have a good coat, give it to the Winterhilfswerk, everyone in Germany. But if Eva Braun would have said, no, I do not want, would a German judge have decided in such a national socialist norm, everyone has to give his coat, except Eva Braun perhaps. So the judges always had the problems that in the courtroom, somebody stood up and said, I'm a friend of Adolf Hitler. If you decide against me, he will kill you. And the judges, they were not sure what will happen. So Hubert Rottleutner, professor uh, um, in Berlin, he had good way, good way for it, good, good wordings, a good term for it. This is substantial decisionism. That means on the one hand, they simply have to decide and this is free. On the other hand, there seems to be a substance. There seems to be a content which they are bound to, but this content is very insecure. And in the way, it's quite similar today in Germany. What is written in the constitution is not very clear. The constitution is quite openly written. There is not very close concepts. So we know what is in the constitution will be set by the high constitutional court. And the high constitutional court is always allowed to change its opinion. So it's not so secure for a German judge if he wants to use the, um, the constitution. Okay. Now we are in the years after 45. In Germany, there was a short period where German lawyers discussed how could this happen? It was a very short period because in the 50s already nobody discussed this anymore. But for a few years, and there was a strange reaction. The reaction was, they said, how could this go wrong? And they said it went wrong in the National Socialist time because we obeyed the law. We know that this is not true. They used general clauses, so it was not so clear what they should obey. And we have lots of cases where they simply produced National Socialist law. They did not follow simply National Socialist law. So it's much too simple. But this was one of the argumentation after 45, the judges used to say, we are innocent. We are innocent because we simply obeyed the law. It's a sentence by Gustav Radbruch. Posit positivism made us helpless. We know this is absolutely true because uh, untrue. They were not positivists, they were anti-positivists. But anyway, this was their strategy. And now they reacted to this strategy and said, okay, now we have to be the guardians of the values. So now we are responsible for the results. And there started a short period between 45 and latest 1960 in Germany, which is called the natural law renaissance. And it was especially, especially very strong for the high court, the Bundesgerichtshof. He had someone um, I will give you soon. And in this context, there's a discussion. What what are these values? Where do they come from? How can we find these values? What shall the judges do to save the values against the positive law and the legislator, which can make wrong decisions? Helmut Cohen, he's very important. He's not a national socialist thinker. He was the very famous legal historian, the founder of the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt uh, for European legal history. And he started as a young scholar um, by producing a kind of Christian natural law. And he uses these general terms like good, good customs to produce moral principles. 
And where does he find them? He finds them by virtue of his conscience. Conscience is very important. Everyone feels in his heart that he are not allowed to do this. We used these concepts when the GDR fell to, um, uh, um, to punish uh, soldiers from the GDR who shot fleeing uh, um, people, fleeing uh, people from the, from the uh, GDR who tried to escape over the frontier. And we said, it was absolutely legal what you did, but in your conscience, you should have, you, will, you will have to have felt that this is not allowed. You are not allowed to kill someone. This idea that we, in our heart, in our conscience, we have in us these values. This is very strong after 1945. And it changes German law quite, uh, quite a lot. But it's in our, our perspective here, it's important for general clauses. He uses general clauses like good customs, good morals to produce moral sentences. No person shall, ex shall exploit a position of power to gain unreasonable advantages in a legal transaction. So this is a German commentary, this Staudinger, this commentary of this paragraph 138. And this commentary, you find these moral norms. No person shall undertake to commit a breach of trust towards third parties. So you see, it's a moralization, but it's a concretization also of these general clauses. No person shall divest himself of his freedom, etc. If you look a bit closer, these moral norms are the result of the judiciary, of decisions, of court decisions mainly. In reality, he took over what the courts did and gave it a moral principle. So these principles did not come out of his heart. If you read the same commentary from 1920, you will find decisions which say similar things, but not in such an, in a moralized way, not as such a moral sentence. This is typical for the time. So that makes the story a bit better understandable, this Christian natural law is quite strong in the German judiciary in private law. And then Nineteen fifty-eight, the Lüt decision by the Bundesverfassungsgericht comes up, and this Lüt decision is the first to, that says we use general clauses for this value system in our constitution to be put into the positive law. But that means we stop the Bundesgerichtshof to produce his own prior, his own natural law without the constitution. The constitution is a stop sign for the Bundesgerichtshof. And this stopped this judiciary, especially in Christian things, which is especially very strong in family law. We will talk about family law to, to, today. In German family law, they have a very conservative Christian uh, um, thinking about men and women. And the Bundesverfassungsgericht stops this and they say, that's it, you're not responsible anymore. We are responsible because we have the constitution. We are the masters of the constitution. And the constitution is the value system which guides every positive law. All this dies in the 1970s. This is the last little story we will have. In the 1970s, the German universities get, as many other countries, a left-wing legal shift, a Marxist shift. So they say, um, what is law? They say law is a superstructure. What is, what is important is the basis. 
What do judges do? Judges have power and they decide because of their social understanding of society. So judges are, do not obey law, not at all. Legal dogmatics is a lie. The reality is it's all about power. So they shift the view from the law and from the natural law and from values onto society, empirics, um, social sciences. This is what they're interested in. And they are interested in a totally different part of these general clauses. These general clauses in Germany, they refer to good customs. That means they refer to customs. This is something which is going on in reality, a custom. They refer to a, to a Verkehrssitte in good faith, according or with respect to the, the customs in society, in, in, the, in the legal society, you could say, something like this, Verkehrssitte. And they say, okay, this is important. This is interesting. There, the code gives us a way to the reality of society. There starts an intensive debate in Germany because they say, before that, if you, have, if you ask a judge, what's a good custom? The judge says, it's a good custom is a thinking of a fair man. Then you can say, okay, this is something empiric. I, I, I use social sciences. So if you ask 50 persons on the street, how would you decide the case? And 50 would say, I would use the solution A. You, are, you have no chance to find out whether these 50 persons you just asked were fair. So the trick was, the judges always said, it's quite, it's something the people feel, the people on the street, the, the fair thinking, man. And if you ask him, how can I find them? Has he a special hat? Uh, has he fair hair? W how do I find these guys? And he would say, hard to say. And then they decided themselves. It was just, just simply the reigning of, a, of the values judges felt. And now they say, no, let's stop this. We want surveys. They want public opinion polls. So they start to get linked to the, to the social sciences. And this is a very interesting story. The German education system has changed in these years. Social sciences are part of all the Law faculties get connected to social science faculties. They shall work together. And the social scientists, the social sociologists, especially, they shall explain to the, to the stupid uh, jurists how reality works. This does not work at all. The sociologists are very aggressive and arrogant. And they say jurists are simply stupid. They have no idea how reality works. The jurists say, I give you one answer. Um, no, 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 they don't want the, the sociologists to take over. And I give you one answer. Um, they use a word um, which is hard to, sure, that's, that's simple. Uh, the, the, the judges did not use it because it's much expensive. You have to decide the case and then, okay, let's stop the case and make a survey which costs uh, 20,000 euros uh, um, to find out what people think on the streets. But jurists always said there's not only a good custom, custom, there can also be a bad custom. So customs are not important. Important is whether they are good or bad. The sociologists said, no, no, important is whether it's a custom. The jurists said, no, no, important is whether it's good or bad. So this was a discussion. Um, Rolf Sack, 2003, you see, it's not very old, uh, um, this quotation. 
the sense of decency of all persons who think in a there you see this is the story to think in a fair and just way who do not only think they have to think in a specific way fair and just cannot simply be de determined by opinion polls because it's not the sense of decency of all people that decides but only of those who think in a fair and just way Furthermore, it is not the sense of decency of all those who normally think in fair and just way because their judgment might be wrong in the specific instance. Therefore, only the sense of decency of those who think in a fair and just way in the specific instance can matter. You see more and more the jurist said who has to decide. No one else is able to do this. This is a very specific way of reasoning. To determine this group of people, one has to know already what is just and fair in the specific, specific single case. That is exactly the problem. If you say, I'm looking for a just and fair man, I have to know what is just and fair to find him. This is a circle, yeah? it does not work. But the person who knows what, is, what this is already knows what, was, what corresponds to good customs in the specific case too. The result is that a survey covering those people who think in a fair and just way in the single specific case becomes redundant. This whole arguing is redundant. Uh, so the question should be, why do we have to ask someone who thinks in a fair and just way? But if we ask somebody who's in a fair and just way, surveys can't, can't help us at all because all these stupid people on the street have no idea of just and fair. You see, it's a struggle between jurists and sociologists. It's about the power, who is in charge to decide the case. And the jurists fight for their own power. Okay. Oh, sorry, oops, for 50 minutes, I will make it, okay. I forgot one uh, very important last group. This is the group of the so-called Wertungsjurisprudenz, which some people say is still the most prominent methodological group in Germany, which I do not think is true. He says, general clauses, uh, this, this movement is a movement coming from the 50s and saying, what is important? What do we have to decide? To what according do we have to decide? And they say, values. And where do these values come from? This is the black box. Karl Lahren says these values come from um, he uses phenomenologists who sell Reinach thinkers before the First World War. And these phenomenologists, phenomenologists, so to say, they say it's a phenomenon you have to find out by living in it. And Karl Lawrence writes a book in 1975, which gives leading values for private law. Vertrauen, trust, for example, equality. And he says, these are simply basic principles of private law. And I, as a scientist, I know this by finding this in life. And his main scholar is Klaus Wilhelm Canaris. He just died a few months ago. He's the most prominent private law scholar for the last 50 years in Germany. And he says, the judge has to decide according to standards which cannot be taken from the general clauses. So general clauses are a black box. But how, what helps us to decide then? He said, you have to look at the circumstances of the case, very concrete. And these circumstances of the case, they will give you the values. You will find them concrete in the decision. In 1996, he says, the acts of juridical thought, which are actually decisive, take place outside the field of formal logic. It's this old, very old, fight in Germany against formal logic, which was never in use by, by lawyers. Formal logic is not the logic lawyers use. As the essence of this law is making value decisions, 
it's the lawyer's task to understand and comprehend valuations, to think things through to an end, so value decisions. And finally, in the last stage, to make value uh, judgments himself. So he wants the judge, they, they call it, um, um, honestly, an, an honestly method or a man, method of honesty. Don't try to hide what you do, say what you believe. So this let, if all these typical process, what a judge does, he uses a norm and he decides by um, taking all the concepts out of the norm and interpreting these concepts of the norm and like this, all these thinking, if this is all wrong, then general clauses are the best way to show us what a judge really does. He makes value decisions. Where does his, these values come? He has to find them in the concrete case. In the concrete case. <clears throat> and they <clears throat> can be found by discussion and uh, um, whatever, <clears throat> not, not with uh, Canaris by the constitution. Uh, this, is not, this is not his main view. <clears throat> <clears throat> and what the idea behind is quite metaphysical. He says all these positive norms we have to work with, they are all pine, kind of a, a part of a teleological system. This is an old idea Savigny had. It's metaphysics. There's teleology sense in reality. And this sense leads us to principles, to values. And these values have to be understood to decide correctly, not the wordings, not so much the concepts of the law. So there's something behind. Similar to what the High Constitutional Court says, there is this value system of the Constitution. This has changed German law, and I will only show you one example. This is a new statute in our code since 2001. And this is the statute um, which allows the judge to make his own value decisions in the case. He has to weigh values and interests. There are conflicting interests and conflicting values. And the judge has to say, I have to, this value and this interest and this value and this interest, and I have to decide to weigh which is the right decision in the case, in the concrete case. You see, there is good faith. And it's disproportionate. So he has to say there are, there are two values and there's a proportion or is it disproportion? Um, and then it's a bit more concrete when it must be the efforts, what efforts may reasonably be required of the obliger and whether he is responsible for the obstacle. So a bit more concrete, but this, this is not a, a norm which you can simply obey. It's a norm which forces you to make the decision. And these norms have become more and more in German private law. This is the result of this value-based thinking. I am too slow. OK. Um, OK, one last very short lesson. When the wall fell down, 1989, suddenly a debate stated, started. The debate was typical Germany. We did not, uh, um, we uh, tried to uh, uh, um, avoid talking about national socialism till they were all dead. Germany, the, the huge legal history uh, about this started in 1968 when they got when they lost their power, the old National Socialists. When they retired, then society changed too late. Now the GDR fell. So the West German thinkers said, okay, no, this is our chance. We have to solve the socialist uh, uh, heritage. So 
So they started to, to make surveys about the GDR. And then they said, Karl Bernd Rüthers, he had, was famous about the National Socialist uh, um, uh, historical, historical Review for 1968. Um, he was one of the prominent uh, researchers on National Socialist era. Um, he drew lessons. What did we learn from National, National Socialists? And then he said, very simple, totalitarian systems use general clauses. We have learned that. And then there came some surveys and said, yeah, that's absolutely true. The GDR lose, uh, used general clauses. But that was only so because these, in these surveys, they looked for sing singular decisions, single decisions about with general clauses. So they found 20 and said, this is very typical. But they did not read the other 10,000 decisions. If they had read them, they would have found out there was only a very short period when they worked with general clauses. And after that, in the beginning of the 50s already, under uh, um, influence of Lenin, uh, of Stalin's uh, um, um, linguistic papers, um, they changed and they said, no, this is a typical bourgeois type of arguing. This is not socialist. What does a socialist do? I give you an example. This is a decision by the High Court of the GDR and it's about whether you can get property from someone, from someone who's not the owner. In German private law, this is allowed if you are in bona fides, if you, have, if you are in uh, good faith, you, you believe he's the owner. And this concept is dangerous if the, one, if the, the property you get is state-owned property. So the question was, I got a, a, a radio, I think it was, the radio in this, uh, I get this radio, but this radio is still owned by the state. And I think the one who gave me the radio is the owner. So I'm in good faith. In German civil code, this would meant, mean, okay, you're the owner. But is it possible to use the BGB against the state? There was no law limiting it. So what do, did the judges do? They said, the social State-owned property is the crucial econo econo economical basis of workers and farmers' power in the German Democratic Republic. So an open, frankly, political discussion. At the same time, the form of ownership uh, that has the decisive influence on the nature of all social and legal relations in our state, and so on. The norms of the German private law, which are state sanctions, are still in effect, can therefore not be applied in so far that they would disturb or affect this development. So the sign, the, the uh, um, development in society, this is what shapes the law. And if there is the law which would uh, destroy or uh, um, offend this development, this law can simply not be applied. It's not existing law anymore. So they say, um, the same holds true for the application of the norms concerning the acquisition of ownership in good faith concerning contained in these are the norms in the BGB which would allow me to become uh, owner of this property. Although the, although the private and especially the personal property of the citizens is protected by the constitution and the laws, the concerns of our workers and farmers in particular require a regulation concerning the protection of state-owned property under private law, which prevents the unlawful lawful sale of state-owned objects in so far as this could cause disturbances in the impact of the economic law of a systematic development of a national economy. So what do they do? They say, we do not use this civil law. This had never happened in German society in German legal history before. The National Socialist Law is, uh, judges, they always use general clauses for them. They said, no, no, I, I um, use the general clause to give me this result. They say, I don't, we do not need any general clauses. Uh, we simply correct the law by political argument. Okay, so now I'm finished already, but I have to give you some four very short results. Um, I'll make this very, what is nowadays? How do we nowadays? Taming the beast. How can we control these general clauses? What do we do? I give you five of working with general clauses in Germany in private law at the moment. The first is very old, case group method. You collect all the cases by judges, you form groups out of them, and these groups secure the law. 
you hope that the judges stay to the groups. Sometimes the judges change their decision and then the group dies. You have to change the group again. But usually if a similar case has been decided 50 times, the judges will stay to that. So you have quite a certain way uh, um, of a certain uh, um, security um, in saying this is what the judges will do in this case, case group method, very simple. These could be cases, just example. The second concept is you, you, you um, systematize what judges do. What is, it's a functional analysis. Good faith, for example, Franz Wierka said that in 1956, has in German private law three functions. The judge uses it to think over and modernize and realize the legislative value plan over the close, two close wordings of the codification alone. Second, he uses it for an unethical abuse or exercise of right to control the exercise of rights. And he uses it to produce new law, contra legum. The third technique is an internal classification types of decisions. So you try to redogmatize what judges do. You do not say they have similar cases. You say in these cases, there is a dogmatic principle and you try to reconceptualize this principle and this principle shall give you more security in what they do. Fourth concept in Germany 2001. This is the old Roman law concept of bona fides, for example. Bona fides in Roman law was used by the praetor to produce uh, new concepts. In the beginning, they were out of bona fides and then they started to become an old, an, an own, a new, a new dogmatic concept. And this, we call it Durchgangsfunktion. This is the gateway, uh, uh, an old Roman law gateway concept. This means um, you have a new problem. Then you, then you say, if the, uh, um, uh, 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 if the, the contractual parties argued like this, it's against the Buddha fides if now one party says, I want you to do this. And after two or three decisions, you say it's not against the bona fides. There's a principle. We have a new dogmatic concept. And then you could say, okay, well, let's, put it now, let's put it back into the code. And this is what, what we did. Before 2001, um, for example, we had this one, the, the most important commentary, the so-called Staudinger, to the Big EB had, let's say, I don't know, 11 volumes. And from this, this for 2,400 statutes about. And from these 11 or 12 volumes, one volume was about 2,242, about good faith, about one section with 1,300 pages. In the 80s, there was a, uh, um, a survey telling us that 10% of the decisions of the Bundesgerichtshof quoted paragraph 242 were based on good faith, 10%. From these 10%, from these 1300 pages, we recodified perhaps three quarter. So most of them is written in a more precise way 
in Germany in the code already. So it's not, again, the not anymore judge-made law by good faith. It's part of the code. Some examples here. All the law of terms and conditions, this is what we looked for, Algemeine Geschäftsbedingungen, are based on decisions which were based on the good morals concept, paragraph 138. Now it's law within the code and other concepts too. And the last concept which still is in charge, you may know the constitution is usually nothing which should be directly applied in private law. Because fundamental rights are against the state and not against your contractor. So it always has to be decided whether the, the right for equality, for example, forces us in private law that the, um, the worker gets the same salary that all other workers in a company whether this part of the constitution, which is said, we need equality, the state has to give us equality, can be used in labor law. So we says, this is a topic where we still use the general clauses as a kind of ability to say, they do not directly interfere into private law. It has to be controlled whether it fits in our private law system, this constitutional argument. So we still use the constitutional guidance in a indirect way by having the general clauses as a gateway, which could be closed. Not every constitutional norm is directly used in German private law. That's it. Sorry, I was too long. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it was an usual lecture of Hans Peter Hoverkamp and uh, fascinated. I, uh, I'm very happy. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm sure we have a lot of the, of questions and uh, and uh, maybe comments and. and uh, Katrin, please. Katrin, microphone. Okay, can you now hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I have a comment and after that I have a question uh, about this uh, good faith and uh, how to judge, uh, understand what is good faith. It's uh, thinking about the uh, uh, how fair and just people think about it and all these big theories and uh, uh, question polls and uh, so on. Uh, in Estonia, we also have this uh, general clause of good faith. It's uh, sometimes uh, referred and uh, sometimes, but not often, uh, it's also used in uh, court decisions. And when we have that kind of problem, uh, then first of all, uh, judge uh, is checking if there has been uh, that kind of case before in Supreme Court. Uh, when there hasn't been that kind of case before, uh, then he or she uh, thinks okay, I am kind of a uh, fair and good uh, person. What is uh, fair and just in my opinion? Uh, then he or she discusses it with some colleagues and sometimes uh, when they have kind of different opinions, uh, then he or she is uh, leaving out uh, names and that kind of details and is discussing it uh, with his or her normal friends. Uh, who doesn't have this uh, legal education? What does this normal people believe? And after that, he or she is ready to decide what is good faith. And of course, these uh, three steps uh, of functional analysis, I think uh, he or she also thinks about them that you mentioned before. And uh, uh, first of all, my question, why is it so difficult in Germany? And my uh, second question is, <laughs> 
how, what do, has ever anyone ever asked how do judges under, understand this good faith? And what are their methods to find this good faith and this um, uh, fair and just thinking? Thank you. I would say um, on your three steps, the third step, I take this, the story to my friends and ask them uh, uh, in a bar, what, what would you decide? Um, is, is a problem in Germany because the judges are not allowed to talk about their cases uh, to friends. So it would have been very abstract, but it's not, you, it's not common that judges uh, uh, um, talk with friends, perhaps with their wives, uh, but uh, in public with friends, because if anybody would hear it, uh, the judge would be out. Uh, he would not be able to um, be judge in this case anymore. So um, I do not think they do it, but um, you say, why it is so complicated? I would say, why is it so simple? Uh, um, if you say, what do you say? I mean, you say, um, if, they are, if there's no higher judge who forces them to do something, they decide what they think of, and then they take their friends from the tennis club or from the rotary club and ask them, and uh, then it's okay. Then if you say this is, this is okay, and this is not complicated, then I would say you have a lot of trust in the judges. In Germany, we would say, um, okay, then the problem arises. Uh, um, if this judge decides about his personal social standards, we would say, where, do, where does he come from? Does he come from a bourgeois family? Has he got migration background? Uh, is he from a worker's family? Where does his social uh, thinking come from? Isn't he uh, a political person? And is it just? Then we would say, okay, we have to vote him, for example. And then there are discussions in Germany, um, perhaps we have to vote him. And on the other side, uh, does our judiciary, is it a mirror of society? Men, women, black, white, Muslims, Christians, all these, you know? What we in reality have is we have a white Christian uh, on the lower levels, female uh, um, judiciary. This is re the reality. And if you say they decide how they think, then they will decide how they think. And if you think they are no friends of you, uh, they will decide against you because they hate people like you. Uh, I don't know, an, an aggressive uh, um, man, uh, um, uh, who is, uh, I don't know, which would never be liked by a female judge in the lower instance, he would say, this is not fair, what happens here. Then you have to solve this problem in a way. What, what, shall, what shall we do with this? Or we say, this is perhaps um, Estonian society is much more homogeneous, I don't know, than German society. We are much more thinking in classes and groups and uh, um, religions, and we are very separated. There's a huge struggle in German society with this multi uh, um, national, multi uh, um, religious society. So we have problems with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, in Estonia, uh, judge is not allowed to share the details about the case. For example, I had Michael who had to pay alimony, alimony for Kate or something like this. Uh, he or she is not allowed to share that kind of details, but he or she can uh, speak in general. I have, I don't know, that kind of problem. Uh, husband doesn't want to pay alimony for children. What would you do or something like this? That the persons behind that case are not uh, acknowledgeable. And uh, second, these uh, friends from tennis club and from Rotary club, I think in Estonia we have, of course, some that kind of judges who have only that kind of friends. But Estonia is much more, um, um, we don't have that kind of class thinking so much. We have many judges with working class background uh, who ha whose uh, first language is Russian and so on. So we don't have so many that kind of problems. But yeah, thank you. Let me add one, one question more. Um, this is how they do it in, in reality. But do they write this down in their uh, opinion? How do, of they, course what not. do they, what do they say? What, what is the, the reasoning they do in the paper? Uh, of course not. Of course they don't say it. Uh, they are trying to express it in more general way. 
uh, for example, if uh, one of colleagues or friends uh, says to church that, okay, maybe this husband doesn't want to pay alimony for children, but he's so poor. Uh, maybe he just, he's not a bad person, but maybe he just don't have more money or something like this. And then judge describes, we have to take into account the different interests and we have to take into account uh, how much money this man has and some kind of more general way. Yeah, this is another culture. I was already thinking the German judges doesn't have any friends. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> they have friends. They, I wouldn't say in the Rotary Club. This is not true. Uh, judges don't don't come into the Rotary Club except they are high court judges. The usual judge will not uh, be accepted there. Uh, um, but they have friends in their group. <laughs> I know the uh, I know many judges, and I would say this is a quite homogeneous group. Uh, um, they are not not all conservative. They are liberal. Part of them all a bit left wing. Uh, um, uh, as, but they are no, I, I know, I, almost no judge. I, we have 7% uh, um, Muslims at the moment. I'm sure we have not more than 1% Muslim judges in Germany. So, and they accept it because they believe, I think, they believe that they simply, that a judge obeys the law. And if you tell them, no, 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 what they do is mere politics, then you will have this, this discussion in Germany. And this will be interesting how this can be solved. Thank you. Any comments or questions more? Um, Honest, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, again, very interesting lecture and a crash course to determine legal concepts. Um, um, I discovered myself thinking that German is like a laboratory, the, probably the best laboratory of testing uh, legal ideas, much better than England or the US where there haven't been such turns in the history, and much better than Russia where I think um, there's less reflection on, on um, reasons behind, although they have had turns. but. Um, Something, um, when you spoke about Heinrich Lange, you mentioned that, uh, uh, that the National Socialism um, uh, declared that they will destroy the formalism, uh, meaning probably positivism. And, and uh, I it just, well, I remember that in the, um, in the Soviet Union, there, was, um, there were similar slogans. There was a witch hunt uh, during the Stalin era where uh, uh, people who were against the, re the regime or who were thought that not to be so loyal, they were accused of uh, being formalists and, and uh, uh, thinking in schablons and, uh, and so on. I don't know how much there was similarity, but just, uh, yeah, I, I recall that um, these, these accusations. Um, um, well, you... As I understand, in the 19th century, there was the uh, empty box thinking. And then later, the, the box was filled in like with ideology. Would it be national socialism or, or just socialism or left wing thinking? Uh, do you think it is realistic, really? Think of a judge as an empty box when applying uh, general clauses. I, 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 I believe. We, we just discussed about the rotary background or Muslim background, whatever. We all come with some sort of background. So I, I would say that the empty box concept is, is artificial. You either are a, I don't know, a royalist or elitist or a socialist uh, or just pragmatic, but you are guided by some sort, some sort of ideas. Is this last, this uh, uh, value jurisprudence, something that, that tries to address this, say, say that it is an empty box, but it's not actually empty. There is something, something in it, um, or or which of the concepts um, in your mind give the best explanation to what's uh, happening in judges' head when applying uh, general clauses. Thank you. I hope I did not say that the judge is the empty box. Uh, the general clause is the empty box. So uh, um, the judge is always filled, and we we are absolutely we, we share the same opinion. Um, 
Um, this was addressed uh, all over the time, but um, the interesting part that which addressed it was the 70s. And um, there they said, um, the judge decides by his socialization uh, where he comes from. And, um, but when this uh, movement started, um, general clauses were not the problem. It was, and, and many methodological thinkers at today would say, general clauses are no problem because the judge does what he wants anyway. So uh, there are no norms at all which can bind the judge. And I think this is too much. Uh, um, I'm, I'm working at the university, so I, I have to test students. And if every decision is correct, uh, we would not be able to, to write any exams. So uh, um, uh, there, is, there is a difference. Uh, and um, so uh, I think general clauses give more freedom than others. Um, if you take this value juris jurisprudence, they depoliticized it. They said the values are there. They did not say it's a political value. It's the, uh, the, this class thinking was the 70s. And the 70s in Germany was a very strong movement. They said it's class justice. It's a, it's a, a term by Karl Liebknecht, you may know. It's older, 19th century, the SPD, the Social Democrat Party. They said class justice, but um, this came up in the 70s again. And then, and I would say at the moment, it's not discussed in Germany. The, the um, judges are very, direct in the judge-made law, we have very strong judges. Uh, they use general clauses as they want it. And there is no, uh, at the moment, I would say there's no political discussion, which um, because I think it's still a reaction on the 70s and the 80s. And there was a very aggressive discussion. We changed all the universities and all that. And this has all been uh, brought back to normal. So the universities make what they did for, before that. And uh, it, we, most of my colleagues have uh, give classes without any political content. There are mere dogmatic classes. This concept, this concept, you have to solve that. The case has to be solved like that, like that. The high court decides like that, but there is no political discussion anymore. This was erased almost from private law 20 years ago, I would say. And perhaps it comes back, we'll see. So the ideal is not an empty judge, of course, but the, a judge uh, who is only filled in with pure law and, and nothing more, no politics, no social background, nothing. Do they manage? <laughs> in in we, the well, judgments, um, uh, when, a court, uh, when a judge is arguing and, and um, um, you know, trying to um, uh, rely on, on some uh, values, uh, do, do they ever mention, I don't know, Christian values or, or well, they refer to the constitution. That's a safe bet, I guess, but uh, um, nothing, nothing more, no. The German legal science in private law, totally different in other parts, criminal law or uh, constitutional law, but in private law, um, they have accepted uh, um, the, um, the reign of the practice. So what the high court says is correct. And so the most professor, for example, in, in company law, very important, a lot of money, much power, uh, many colleagues work in company law, for example, but um, their main aim is to become part of a small group which is invited by the second senate of the Bundesgerichtshof, which is in charge for company law. And they, if they are invited, they are part of the power. So they, they totally gave up, I would say, the autonomy of science and the, the, the external perspective. They, are, they do not criticize the practice. They try to get part of the practice. They try to get, to get a partner of um, legislation, for example. Uh, it's a, the German private law professor is famous if he was part of the, he was in the Bundestag and he was heard with his uh, um, meaning. So this is totally different to the 19th century, for example. They, they said, we are the science and this is the reality. And uh, these are two, two separated ways of working. This is not anymore. And so this means also that uh, legal science and private law is not a critical uh, outside view on what happens in Germany. This mm -hmm. is more in politics, left-wing parties, they criticize it. For example. And they are not, especially in commercial law, I would, I would imagine you would um, also rely or invoke uh, economic principles. But I remember you saying in some of the previous lectures that uh, 
there's not much uh, economic analysis in uh, jurisprudence. There's in, a small group, but uh, what is always but it's very marginal, small. not 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 the mainstream. Thing. No, but, but small, strong group, good, good. We had Wagner, Holger Fleischer, very prominent thinkers. But what's, what is always said in Germany is economic analysis uh, is no correction of the law. So there is no political principle in it. It's just a way of arguing if efficiency and uh, it's a way of, yeah. but they, it's not seen as a political movement. You could see it. I have a colleague here. Um, he has a system theory uh, concept. He is a private law theorist and he has a political concept. That means we have to build networks and we have to share knowledge and all this. Well, here, Sander and Seem and I, we, we all practice uh, commercial law um, uh, or financial law. And, uh, and uh, I would say that uh, uh, investor protection, for instance, uh, or, or company law, it, it, it is very much, well, it depends on, uh, on both economy and, and on political decisions also, because the the judgments they have consequences on 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 uh, well yeah funds uh, and and uh, wealth of people so that's why I, I can't imagine how you can just apply pure law without um, considering the economic arguments in uh, in commercial law of that type at least i would say they sure they have economic arguments but they do not have an economic theory mm -hmm. so they they do not have a concept uh, they, they criticize certain things. If you are a friend of the banks and the, the bank senate uh, uh, is against the banks, you will argue against the bank senate. Sure. And you will say this is an economic catastrophe. Yeah. But you will not uh, argue with uh, theoreticists or with an economic theory from the US. I, I, my impression, most of my colleagues will not do this. How is it with, with you in, in Estonia? Do you uh, say then, okay, there's this Harvard theory and uh, you criticize the, the high court uh, out of such a position? Well, we, we have had cases where, for instance, uh, dividend policy has been um, uh, challenged or, or, or the, the rules about payment of dividend to minority and, and so on, uh, where economic arguments have been um, used. But uh, to my mind, not by the judges, or I, I'm not sure the judges have given much thought about uh, those arguments. But I, I think lawyers we, we raise from time to time, especially on, on uncertain cases, we, we try to argue about the economic uh, consequences of a decision or interpretation of, of a rule one way or another. And, uh, but yeah, I agree. It's, it's marginal practice. So it's not by using a macroeconomic theory when you argue. Yeah, we have tried to invoke uh, economic analysis, yes macroeconomic okay. uh, theories but but uh, it's it's a bit far-fetched and not, not easy to understand uh, for a judge who is a, a, a i would say well a trained lawyer and not very familiar with the concepts and macro macroeconomics no. okay. thank you thank you thank you santa do you have any, any question yeah i have a small question um, regarding the, you're, you're describing uh, this, this, this is like a German way, this general clauses. When I was looking uh, during your course, uh, well, 242, we have exactly the same paragraph in our law. 275, we have it as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's very similar. So I think yeah, we can, it's rather copy based in, in a sense that uh, we have the same issues with general clauses and, and, and that it's very useful lectures. But what you have given today, um, but I had a question about Austria. Do they do they have a similar concept or, or it, it's it's different? I don't know anything about Austria. No, maybe you can say a few words about it if if you know if they have also general clauses or not. And the reason why I'm asking is I, I read an article and I did, it was about my topic about um, how the surety ship uh, law is handled and in in Germany they summarize that it's a uh, German adopt, uh, adoption of a constitutionalized private law approach, whereas Austrian have maintained more. The Meine Bürgerliche Gesetz in Austria, they also have general clauses. They also have this Roman law foundation, um, but they and they have a theory which is close to us, uh, and the, there are many. Theo Mayamali, for example, uh, Austrian professor, he writes uh, about uh, um, 
good morals uh, uh, in German commentaries and in Austrian commentaries. So it's a very close shop was what, what this uh, uh, this theory means. But in reality, as far as I know, I know some uh, one I court judge uh, from the Oberste Gericht in Wien, Vienna, and um, um, from talking to him, my impression is. Um, in Germany, uh, general clauses are more important because we have this very uh, uh, systematized and strict code, the Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch, which is quite uh, um, precise. You would never say that to the Allgemeine Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch from 1811. This is not a very precise code. So that means uh, every Austrian would say, um, if we want to say what's going on in, in Austria today, we do not look in the code anymore because the code has been uh, um, overruled and overruled by the judges. So um, I think in Austria, private law is much, was my impression, is much more uh, judge-made law than in Germany still. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I can give the possibility for one question more. We, we, we are not anymore in the time, but, but uh, if someone wants to say something more, it is possible. And if, if not, we, we have the break until the uh, 15 after, after one. And we are very, very grateful. Thank you, Hans Peter. It, it, it was a big, big pleasure to hear you and, and to think with you. And, and, uh, and we, we have a lot of food for thinking for, 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 for a long time, I think. It's, uh, and as, as, the, as the editor in chef of the Estonian, Estonian journal, in the, uh, Juridica International. Your article will be welcome in, for this for this journal, <laughs> and and uh, it was not uh, not a joke. Uh, although we we have Mario in uh, speaking, <laughs> I mean it very seriously. Thank you very much. Have a nice lunch time, everybody, and we will see in uh, in forty minutes. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. See you then.